When the Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell described Earth from space, he wrote, there emerges a sparkling blue and white jewel, a light and delicate sky blue sphere laced with slowly swirling veils of white. Seemingly limitless, the sheer physical power of the ocean dominates our planet and profoundly influences climate and the weather across the globe. It evokes awe, wonder, sometimes fear, and ultimately supports all living organisms. Much remains to be learned from its exploration. More than 80% of this vast underwater realm remains unmapped, unobserved, and unexplored. Worryingly, the health and sustainability of our ocean species and resources are in doubt. Oceans themselves are changing at a faster rate than ever before in human history. Never has there been a more crucial time to turn our attention to the watery depths to form a better, more accurate understanding of the relationship between life below and above the ceaseless waves. The Earth oceans represent one of the most stable environments that we have ever known, uh, but it goes back to their evolutionary past where they were initially formed when the Earth was a nothing more than really a molten ball of rock. And it was almost the end of the Earth because there was a collision between the Earth and a Mars-sized object. And that collision, some people think, actually helped to transfer a molten iron core to the centre of the Earth. And that molten iron core actually created a magnetic shield around the Earth, protecting it against the significant dangerous solar winds that were being bombarded with up till that point. Now, the development of a magnetic field meant that the gases that were being pumped out by the volcanoes, instead of being blown out to the solar system, they started to collect around the Earth. And as the gases, particularly carbon dioxide and water, started to collect, and they rose further in the atmosphere, they started to cool. And eventually, they started to fall as an early rain. Now, because of all that rain containing lots of carbon dioxide, it, it demonstrates a process that we're now suffering from, which is acidification, where the carbon dioxide dissolved with the water, CO2 dissolves into H2O, to produce an acid, carbonic acid, H2CO3. And that acid was remarkably strong. In fact, it, it destroyed, it melted a lot of the juvenile rocks. The remnants of the rock that were left over are actually the salts that we have in the sea at the moment. And over the uh, intermediate period of time, the initial acid seeds from carbonic acid slowly started to change into the current alkaline environment that we have now. The seas pH are currently around about 8.2 to 8.4. And over the period of time as well, one of the sig most significant biological processes to evolve was that of photosynthesis. And we considered that there were some tiny little bacteria-like algae we call cyanobacteria, which are still present around today, that were the first to evolve photosynthesis. They simply used gases that were commonly available, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, or later on water, and started to use the energy from the sun, the solar radiation being quite intense at that point. And because of that, they managed to fix carbon dioxide and water together to create the first carbohydrates. And those first carbohydrates became the basis of what we have now as a complex food chain. But one of the key waste products they produced was oxygen. And given the entire world was anaerobic, lacking in oxygen at that time, that waste product killed everything. You could argue it's the first, the greatest ever mass extinction. That also enabled the evolution of the next key fundamental step. Again, some people consider it to be the single biggest evolutionary step, a process called endosymbiosis. And that's where one cell lived inside another. 
and that led to the evolution of what we call eukaryotic cells. And those eukaryotic cells are complex cells in the basis of you and I now. And that allowed organisms to become more specialist, uh, which meant they became more complex. And again, it led to the evolution of, a, of this sort of broad, fascinating biosphere that we have at the moment. But it does mean that because the oceans were largely stable for a few hundred million years, that all the organisms that were evolving within that environment haven't been required to evolve the ability to tolerate much of a change. It appears that as we are changing the environment through acidification or pollution and global warming, then a number of the organisms simply haven't evolved the ability to tolerate that change and therefore are becoming stressed, or perhaps even worse, are being killed by this process. Um, and hence we're looking at uh, a significant change in the diversity of species in the marine environment associated, it appears to be, and the evidence all suggests, no matter what anyone else would say, associated with anthropogenic impact, pollution, global warming, acidification, carbon dioxide and methane. Now, uh, one of the issues is from our point of view is that, um, I mean, I come from the Midlands, probably the furthest point from the, the sea that you could possibly have in England. And, uh, you know, as a, as a, a young lad, I'd think, you know, what, what on earth is that going to do to me? Why am I bothered about this? And there are several key issues. Not only do we get a lot of proteins from the sea, not only do we rely on the sea for lots and lots of products, but perhaps crucially, every other breath that we take is associated with photosynthesis, associated with those marine phytoplankton that are part of the marine environment. And if we start to change the marine environment dramatically, we can't predict but there is a possibility that we could start to change the diversity of organisms which may indeed have an impact on their basic ability to photosynthesize and therefore possibly reducing the amount of oxygen that we have together with the whole range of other ecosystem services on which we depend. There can be no argument that we are changing the environment. What we perhaps can't do is predict exactly what is going to change, how it's going to impact on us. We can only suggest that it will do and possibly because we can't accurately model, accurately forecast what's going on, it does leave room for those people who perhaps don't wish to face up to the fact or perhaps have an economic value in maintaining these old working methods that appear to be having an impact, it probably leaves them the option to say, well, you can't prove it, therefore we're not going to change it. And again, really, we are perhaps getting to a point where if we don't change our environment, if we don't change the way we use our environment within the quite near future, we could reach a tipping point beyond which it will become substantially more difficult to pull back the problems that we've had and pull back the problems that we've caused. So it's an area that you could regard as being scary in many respects because who knows what's going to go on. I personally think it's an area of intense incitement where we have the ability to change things dramatically to benefit everything on this planet, including us and those little phytoplankton on which we all depend. The anthropogenic changes that appear to be occurring in the marine environment have led to the detriment of, uh, in, in many cases, of the diversity of species that live in the environment. Many species just simply can't adapt quickly enough to cope with these changes. However, there are a number of species that uh, have an inherent ability to cope. Uh, an example would be many species of cephalopod or squid. The vampire squid is a classic example. Uh, now, um, these particular organisms uh, their numbers appear to be booming because um, as we're polluting the seas with nutrients we're creating what we call oxygen minimum zones or dead zones where there's very little oxygen and that as you can imagine kills off a whole host, host of different sort of uh, uh, organisms but the squid uh, because it has a particular copper based pigment in its blood is able to tolerate those relatively low levels of oxygen so it will actually use these OMZs, oxygen minimum zones, almost as a refuge to either escape from predators or indeed to ambush their food from. Because we're fishing the world's seas out and almost eating everything in the sea, we're also removing a lot of the competitors and predators of squid. It does mean that then the numbers of these particular really unique organisms is just growing into abundance. And it's one of the few species that actually is doing well because of man's influence. Similarly, the nadarians, the jellyfish, are doing remarkably well. Uh, although there are lots of reasons behind this, it does appear that again we're fishing out their main predators and therefore with no predators we're affecting the entire food chain and that has led to 
vast swarms of jellyfish being found around many areas of the coast. Um, as we're, we're eating their competitors and their predators, it also means that they also have a vast range of food sources that they can use. Um, and again, because they're rather unusual life cycle, um, their life cycle really, in many cases, or not exclusively all of them, will consist of having a, an asexual section of a life cycle, which means they can rapidly reproduce if the environment is good. And then they have a sexual component of their life cycle, which means uh, they can evolve somewhat to, to look at their changing environment. So again, they've managed to take advantage of this, of this changing environment and take advantage of the um, rather sudden reduction in predators. One of the challenges of looking after a marine, marine environment, certainly in the near future, is associated with uh, perhaps the open access uh, management of our open oceans. If we take a, a sort of zone from our high water mark to about 200 miles out, most countries will control that themselves to a greater or lesser extent. We call that the economic exclusion zone. And within that, we are supposed to be able to control the uh, uh, the management of our resources, control our fishing, oil exploration, that sort of thing. However, when we start to go outside of those 200, 200 nautical mile zones, we open into the open ocean, where the amount of management control legislation is pretty limited. And some people say that's a good thing. However, it does mean that uh, exploitation of resources could be unmanaged, over-exploitation of many marine stocks goes on, uh, and so there's an increasing sort of trend towards trying to enclose or control significantly bigger areas. And hence we're looking at um, things like the Marine Protected Areas, or MPAs. We're looking at controlling significantly bigger areas, enabling uh, the management of more resources. And if there's a possibility, and there is, of trying to link these MPAs together, it means that there'll be significant areas of the world's oceans that are carefully controlled, preventing over-exploitation. We often consider that the marine environment is under threat, and it, and it is. But, you know, we have a remarkably adapted species, the human being, and it's a species that I think is always looking for self-preservation. And whilst there are a number of us who are looking for commercial exploitation for short-term gains, then I think on an intergenerational basis we're slowly realising the importance of sustainable management, sustainable exploitation of our marine resources. And therefore, I do think, again, from a generation to generation, we are getting closer, more ingrained on the idea of sustainable development. And although the situation may appear to some to be extremely grim, I think it's a period of immense challenge from a human's point of view. And it's a challenge we have no choice. We either rise to that challenge and take it on and solve the problem, or we don't. And the repercussions of not doing that are going to be significant. It's exciting because we have to now solve these issues. And I see it all the time in my, and the students I've been lucky enough to teach for the last 25 years. It's a challenge that many of them are taking up, more and more of them taking up. And again, I've been lucky enough, if I can say I've been a small part in that, then I just think I've been a lucky man from that point of view. How we protect our oceans is one of the biggest issues the world faces today. Now is the time to reimagine, resuscitate and reforge a relationship with the ocean based on sustainability and protection. <laughs>